Well, if you have a Bible, you can turn uh, to James chapter 5, verses uh, 7 through 11. Um, this, I don't know if these, uh, the last few weeks, really have a theme. Maybe, maybe part of the theme is things I want to get better at. Um, and, and I think in some way I'm uh, challenging myself to look at Scripture again uh, and, and, and preaching and really letting you listen as I preach to myself. And today will be one of those days where I think we all, when we hear the topic of patience, uh, we will all say, oh, oh, not me, not me. Well, um, be patient. This sermon will be over soon. Um, but uh, I think in the meantime, hopefully God will have something to say to us, uh, including, uh, including myself. So um, James chapter 5, verses 7 through 11. Be patient, therefore, brothers and sisters, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it until it receives the early and the late rains. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. As an example of suffering and patience, brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we consider those blessed who remain steadfast. You have heard of the steadfastness of Job, and you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. Amen. Father, as we open your word this morning, we pray that you will speak to us through it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, just in reading the other day, uh, I came across an article uh, a, a, about a study that was done at UCLA with, with two groups of students. It was interesting. The first, um, the, but both groups of students were, were given $1,000, not, not actually $1,000, but they were, um, it was hypothetical, they were given $1,000 unexpectedly. And the first group of students was directed to uh, invest a certain portion of, of that $1,000. It was somewhere uh, less than 10% uh, to be received at, by the time they get to the age of 70. The second group of students um, went into another room, I think, and they got uh, a virtual uh, reality uh, headset, and they were allowed to see a picture of themselves at the age of 70 with all the age spots and wrinkles, added weight, and everything else. So when they saw that virtual avatar of themselves, they were then asked the question, how much of that money did they want to invest? And they invested more than double than the first group. And it was interesting, the, the, the point of the article was about, um, you know, when you see a picture, at least in this case, of yourself in the future, when you see that clear picture, it changes the way uh, your investment behavior happens now. The way you think about yourself then impacts the, really what you do with your, your resources now. And I think when we look at James chapter 5, James is doing something similar here as he's helping his congregation through uh, what we all struggle with in terms of patience. And he's giving them three pictures to look at in an effort to help them change their behavior when it comes to this crucial area of patience. In other words, when you see a picture, and the three pictures that he points out here, the farmer, the prophet, and who I will call Job, the father, when you see these three pictures, hopefully you see that something will have to undergo a transformation in your heart, namely in terms of patience. And so as we look at the scripture this morning, what I want to do is just pull out each one of those pictures, just take a look at each one of the three, and think together with you, how we might be able to grow in this area. Because patience isn't simply a, a virtue to be cultivated. It's a gift that God gives to us that we need to pray that God will continue to manifest. It's a fruit of the Spirit that he'll help us along in this journey together, growing in this key area of our lives called patience. Patience. Listen again to the first two verses. Be patient, therefore, brothers. And I think you'd include sisters here. There's uh, there's, there's an open uh, door to be able to make sure that we understand that. Until the coming of the Lord, see how the fruit, or see how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it until it receives the early and the late rains. 
You also be patient. Establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. So the first picture that's given here is the picture of the farmer. The farmer waits patiently in light of the fact that he or she is not really in control of everything. The farmer waits patiently knowing that he or she is not fully in control of everything. The text starts with this command, be patient. The idea comes from two words that are, that are jammed together in the original language, the first one being long or big, and the second one being desire or tempered. So if you think about that word coming together, be long-tempered. That's what it means to be patient, long-fused. You could even think about it in terms of long-wrath. Be long-tempered. The situation he's writing into is a dire one. The people who have become believers are being opposed. They're being scattered. They're being mistreated. Things are happening in an unjust sense. Life doesn't make any sense anymore. Their circumstances are not lending them to be uh, patient, having a long fuse with the people who oppose them. There's, there's certainly more and more temptation opportunity to be short-fused easiest thing to do is to lash out back at those people. They have all the justification in their minds in the world. They've been treated unjustly. And you can find some commonality with all of us. There's some, there's some senses in which we know when we've been wrong. We have every right in the world to be justified in blowing our top. To do something to lash out. So easy. The Bible here calls us to be patient. It's learning how to play the long game with God. To know God's undeniable patience toward us, though, is the first thing we have to remember if it's ever going to be manifested in us. You first have to understand God's unbelievable patience toward each one of us before it's manifested truly in us. James would have known what Moses knew after the fiasco of the golden calf coming down from the Mount uh, of Sinai, Exodus 34, 6. The Lord says, the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. The witness in the Old Testament, which would have been James's text that he was thinking about, was of a God who exercised over and over and over again divine restraint, making room for steadfast faithfulness and mercy, sheer mercy. The people who don't deserve it. Over and over and over again, that was the experience of the Old Testament witness. And I think what James would too have recognized that if you've seen by faith, once Jesus has come, the prophet par excellence, son of the living God, our Father in heaven, faithful shepherd, farmer with a capital F when it comes to the tilling of the soil in our hearts, when he's come, what we see is the, uh, the long wrath held off, deserved for each one of us, is now poured out onto himself in his son. His son exchanging places with us, taking what we deserve, his life for ours. And patience is really the understanding of True gospel patience is the understanding of that exchange first. And I think that's why we have to do uh, a job in our own minds to continually remember that God, yes, is a God of mercy and grace, but he's also a God of wrath. You're never really going to understand patience very well until you understand that concept. That wrath was poured out on Jesus for us. That God in his divine restraint and faithfulness waited until the moment that would change all of human history. When Jesus bled and died on that cross and then walked out of the tomb on the third day, we can be th thankful for the fact that God continually gives us a second chance. And we can look back to him who's broken our chains of impatience and look to his strength to help us. But as we look at the, 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 exp the experience of the Father, we learn a little bit more about just the rudimentary elements of what it means to be patient. This picture of the farmer. What can we learn from the farmer? Well, there are things that are under his control, of course. He plants the seed, preps the soil, he reaps the harvest in due time. The farmer 
takes the weeds out, the farmer makes sure everything is prepared, the farmer is making sure at the time of the harvest that the crops are guarded, the farmer has a lot of responsibility. But not everything, not, not, not everything he does is under his own control. There are things that are out of his control. The earth is not something he's created. The earth and the land is something given to him or her. He didn't make it, but he tends it. The farmer, it says here, receives the rain. It's interesting. The farmer receives something. He can't make the rain happen. There's a sense of the rhythm to the seasons. There's early rain. There's late rain. There's a time when the rain comes and, and prepares the soil early on. There's a time where it really starts to do its work in helping the crops grow. But be that as it, as it may, he doesn't control that. That's completely out of his control. Now you think about one of the reasons why we are so prone to impatience and wrath is because we have a control problem. That there are things in our lives that we simply don't have control over, but we want to. We want to control everything. And there are times that we delude ourselves into thinking that we can and do. We often get so angry and impatient and wrathful because these things happen outside of our control. There are times where we want to take credit for things that obviously we don't have a, a leg to stand on to take credit for, but we want to. The farmer can't truly take credit for this precious fruit. I mean, yes, he did the work, but there was a cooperative happening such that when the rains came and the sun shined and the, then the fruit grew, where did he get the seed from? He didn't create it himself. Something that was ultimately given. See, we can worry, we can, we can badger, we can get upset, we can be proud. But none of that changes what is out of our control, especially when it relates to people and relationships. So to have a long fuse before God and a long fuse, a longer fuse with people, part of what we have to recognize when we look at the, farther, when we look at the farmer is that there are things that are in our control but things that are out of our control. And we have to trust God, especially when we think of the things that are out of our control. Like the farmer who waits patiently, this is a process. It's a process. In fact, in the, in the, in the passage here in verse 8, it says, you also be patient. And here, here's the process. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. So part of this process of learning how to wait patiently is, is heart establishment. What is that? Well, just think about it from what, where the text is taking us here. There's first thing, it's very, very important. Because twice it's repeated here. The coming of the Lord is, is at hand. Christ is coming back. One of the first things we have to recognize if we're going to establish our hearts with true gospel sense of patience is that the nearness of the Lord must be in our awareness all the time, that Jesus is coming back, that he promises his presence to us on a daily, moment-by-moment -moment basis. We have a growing sense of awareness of his nearness. And if I have that growing sense of awareness to his nearness, perhaps as I establish myself in that fact, my, my, my feelings and desires to sh in a short, fused sense to lash out at my circumstances, other people will be quenched when I recognize the Lord is at hand. That I will give an account for some of my words in a positive sense, of course, when he comes back. But in the, in the same respect that my words have an impact that he hears about, he knows. I need to make room for him. When I establish my heart, I recognize that patience is a command that I often break, needs to be repented of. When I establish my heart, I need to recognize that it's my responsibility to till the soil of my heart when it comes to the things I know about God. In Galatians 5.22, it says, the fruit of this, one of the fruits of the Spirit is patience, love, joy, peace, patience. That's a fruit. Now think about what God is committed to in the fruit-bearing process, he's committed to reaping a harvest. God is committed to that work. 
He who began a good work in you will bring it to completion. When he starts the gardening project, he will finish it. And you can take that to the bank as you think about yourself if you've come to understand who Jesus Christ is by faith, possessing the Holy Spirit. That there is a cooperative in effect on this farm. That God is committed to producing a harvest. You must be committed to tilling the soil of your heart. But it's his power that will do it. Paul planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. Over and over and over again in the scripture, it talks this way. Second thing I have to remember as I am toiling the soil of my heart, I need to remember that God is going to grow my patience through my failure. My failure. The word establish here, or strengthen, is also used by Jesus when talking to Peter as he predicts his betrayal. And when you turn back, Peter, strengthen your brothers. Isn't that interesting? That part of the process in Peter's life of really learning what it means to be truly patient, to be established, was going to come through some of the biggest failure. As we think about the failures in our own life, when it comes to impatience, God is going to use that as a tool to establish not only us, but other people. Certainly not a license to keep doing it, but certainly at the end of the day when we look back on it, we can at some level have a, ha, have a, a time of grieving, but I think also know that God doesn't see these things as accidents, but as things to prepare our soil as we think and pray before him. We're going to have plenty of these times. And you think about like uh, <laughs> epic failure. That's why, that's why I said, I, I think this is a sermon for me that I'm allowing you to listen to. I, I spent like half a Thursday, half of my Thursday on this subject. Got to, got to, got to a couple hours after I was done with it, at least that, that part of it, and, total, and, and totally blew it. We were, we were supposed to go to uh, the Browns-Eagles game on Thursday night, okay? And I'm so anxious. I'm keyed up about it. I want to get there early. I want to see the Eagles. That's my team. But then, you know, God had another plan. I don't want to eat stadium food. It's too expensive. God had another plan. I, I, was, so, I was so anxious to get to a preseason football game. I wasn't going to rescue, a, a, a burning, a burn, you know, rescue someone from a burning building. I wasn't going to, to lead someone to Christ in their deathbed. I was trying to get to a preseason Browns game. I mean, think about that. And, and the Eagles lost five to nothing. That's, that's like the worst football, football score in the history of football. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't even cheer. It was so putrid. And, and to think, <laughs> the, the lesson I'm learning, I, I actually think God had that lesson just for me. Like, Super Bowl champions go and score zero times in an entire night. You know, and, and here I am, I'm so anxious to get to my seat to see what? See nothing. But isn't, isn't that the way impatience works at times? It's like you get so anxious, you get so keyed up, you, you, you so want to control every aspect when there are things that are out of our control, out of my control. And what's our, what's our you know, what's our response? It's, it's to have a short fuse. It's wrong. Blow it. I blow it. We blew it. And I... I I, ju I just think they're, they're, every day is going to have these opportunities to exercise this kind of patience that the picture the farmer gives to us, to wait patiently. What does that mean? It means to have an expectancy as we wait, to know that the Lord is at hand. Till the soil in our minds to know that patience is a fruit God is committed to uh, bringing a harvest. But we've got to work diligently as we walk with him farmer is the first picture. The second picture is the prophet. The prophet. In light of opposition, the prophet patiently spoke the truth. Verses 9 and 10. Do not grumble against one another, brothers and sisters, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. As an example of suffering and patience, brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. You see something that, 
that um, James is doing here. He's helping us understand through these pictures. Now that you've seen the farmer, and there were probably plenty of farmers that would have been listening to or reading this or, or hearing about this in some way. Secondly, think of the prophets who we all have heard of. You look at the experience of the prophets, you don't have to look very hard to find that they went through suffering, they went through difficulty, they went through trial. Jeremiah was detained, branded as a traitor, thrown into an abandoned well to die. Elijah announced that there would be drought for three and a half years, and then he went through it. Daniel was famously thrown in the lion's den. The list goes on and on. And in each case, we see that they endured through that trial, continued to live and speak for the Creator who would redeem them. God gave Elijah the victory, preserved Jeremiah through the siege, rescued Daniel from the mouths of the lions. God showed himself faithful. And as he continued to do that, they spoke. They patiently spoke the word of the Lord. And what James is saying to us here is that we are supposed to do the same thing. Patiently continuing to speak the word of the Lord. Now, of course, of course, our stubborn, sinful nature still taking hold. And while we would have liked to say something positive, scriptural, God-honoring, what sometimes comes out of our mouth is complaining. Saying something, grumbling something, moaning something that we shouldn't. Which is why it makes so much sense that James would say, do not grumble against one another. You're the reason that this happened. Ugh. Of course, we constantly do this. And part of what it means to grow in uh, Christ, grow in our sanctification, is to catch ourselves before all that junk comes flying out of our mouths. James says, stop complaining. We're supposed to be reaping, reaping a harvest with our mouths. We're supposed to be speaking in such a way. But, again, to think like the farmer, our, our mouths, our, our tongues become like a sickle to lop off the heads of people in our impatience. Same thing is true when we think about being opposed for being Christians. And that, that, that's exactly what's happening here. The thing that was going to make the community different was that when believers were opposed for what they believed, they did not retaliate. They didn't strike back. But they held their tongues. They were committed to pray. This is what would make them as a community completely different from the rest of the peoples around them. And when you think of Jesus, the prophet, capital P, par excellence, as he continued to speak the word of truth to people who needed to hear it, he spoke truth patiently while he was opposed, even from within his own inner circle. You remember the story that he tells about the servant, the unforgiving servant, who owed his master millions of dollars in gold and could not repay. So he asked him to have mercy on him, and he would repay. So the master had compassion on him, forgave him the debt. Then Jesus said, that servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. So he's forgiven for millions. Guy owes him 50 bucks. It's a much smaller amount. And his servant seizes the other one, begins to choke him, saying, pay back what you owe fellow servant says, be patient with me and I'll repay you. But the first who was unwilling went and threw him into prison that he should pay back everything he was owed. And of course the story is about a patience that was richly received, a grace, a, a, a generosity that was richly received through the patience of the first. The master of the house. That wasn't, that, that patient wasn't, that patience wasn't reciprocated by the receiver. And not re the fact that it wasn't reciprocated is just an evidence of the fact that that grace had not really taken root in that person's heart. And when you think about it in this way, a, a patience that is so richly received is a patience that ought be freely offered. That becomes the point. Do you freely offer in a generous spirit these things because you have received so much? And as a community, we have to continue to soak this in our own minds. 
we've been forgiven so much. And because of that, we can endure through difficulty and trial with people who oppose us. If we have received such a, a wonderful, generous patience on the part of our, our Father in heaven, a generous grace given to us, and having every debt we'd ever owe God repaid, how can we not go and then help others in that same position who may owe us to say the debt is taken care of, to exercise that kind of Christ-centered patience? That's the point. The prophets spoke these things. The prophets were patient as they did so. Finally then, the farmer, the prophet, and Job, the father. If the prophet is one who speaks patiently, the farmer is one who waits patiently, Job is the one who bore patiently, bore a burden, and learned about God and his nature in the deepest of ways. He bore patiently. The word for patience here is a little bit of a different word. It's an interesting little uh, distinctive that is introduced here into the text. Behold, we consider those blessed who remain steadfast. So there it is. You have seen, uh, you, you have heard of the steadfastness of Job, and you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. So there's this little twist on the word. As we get to uh, Job, sort of the, the father of, of all suffering. And in a sense, the, the word has, again, two ideas pushed together. Remain under. Remain, remain under. So Job's steadfastness is remaining, uh, re being able to stand under the weight of a pressure. You think about that weight of pressure. He lost all of his wealth. He lost his family. He lost basically everything in this world. And there is a kind of energetic resistance that Job demonstrates, though he's going through this incredible pain. And that pain is associated then with patience. Patience. That as you are under a kind of incredible pain and hurt, you can exercise a kind of patience, a steadfastness, a grip, an energetic resistance to that pain through the power of God. And that's, I think, really what the picture of Job is starting to give to us. Because it, on the one hand, he's dealing with this incredible pain of grief and losing everything. And then as he's grieving, his, his wife comes to him, tells him basically to have nothing more to do with God and to go and die. His friends now come to him with, with a message. And, and that message is basically, you've been unfaithful, something now bad has to happen to you. And part of the resistance in Job's heart is the resistance of the people who are closest to him to act in an unfaithful way to God as a result of these circumstances. To listen to the friends. They, they pick up on the worldview of the, of the people around them. Well, you did something bad, so something bad's happening back to you. That was not the case in the book of Job. Actually, Job has been faithful. And that was the reason he was going through suffering. So it was the complete opposite. Job's wife just says, end it all? That's it? That's the plan of God here? No. No. It's to stand with God. And the amazing thing about the book of Job here is that the, the vision God gives him at the end of the book, a deep look into God himself, for as much as any human being could ever have, and, and, and I, just, I, I just read about this, uh, I, I read uh, a comment on this by uh, an author named Paul Grimmond. He wrote the book Suffering Well. I, I just, I want to read um, his comment because I, I found it very, very helpful. He says, Job encounters God face to face. He meets the all-powerful creator and ruler of the world, and all he can do is fall on his knees and worship. Job never finds out what happened in heaven. He never finds out the reason for his suffering. He never has his questions answered. And this is, this is the little point here. He simply meets God and all of his issues dissolve. He simply meets God 
and all of his issues dissolve. There is nothing he can do before the face of the Lord except to grant him honor. Now, if you, th if you think about the, the patience of Job, the trial he is under, to think that when you come into the presence of Almighty God, that all the questions that you had before, they're going to fade away. Because you are now in the presence of something that you could ne never get your mind around. And to think that we only come up with a few different reasons for why we think the bad things are happening to us, that are happening. In the infinite mind of God, there are trillions upon trillions upon trillions to the trillionth power. But there is something so majestic about his presence that when we stand in front of it, all the issues that we thought we had are gone. Gone. We have this picture of Job who now in front of an almighty and wise God also is receiving the power of that wise God in his life to be able to stand up. Not end his life as his wife was trying to implore him to. Not to come up with false reasoning the way his friends and the worldview around him was imploring him to. But simply to stand with God and learn how to be wise as he followed God through his pain. To learn patient endurance. Recognizing God is not absent from his suffering, but sovereignly walking him through it. And the more he learns this, the more deeply he drinks from the well of mercy and compassion. In other words, instead of taking his wife's advice, he will learn to say, shall we receive only good things from God and not evil? To the plan of God, he says, if he tears down, none can rebuild. Only he can do it. And to think, if he understands God's power and wisdom that way, through his pain, he is a, a student at, at the feet of so great a teacher. But he has to go through this, this, this classroom, this trial of pain. And what he is learning along the way is patience that he bears up under through a strength not his own. How many people perhaps we have observed or we have seen ourselves that we would say, how did you get through this? It just doesn't seem like it's you doing it. And the truth is, it's not. It's God in you and his grace. <laughs> it, it's so funny about patience because just when you least expect it, you start, you start learning the lesson. I'm, 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 I'm coming to the... Uh, to the end of finishing this sermon. And I'm trying to, I'm trying to finish at a, at a certain time. And I'm doing okay. And then something kind of starts going haywire on my computer. Like I, I can't get to, the, to this next page to finish my thoughts. So I, I keep having to go up, scroll up, come back down. Where is it? There it is. Go, nope, no, nope, nope. scroll up. Where is it? Now I'm starting to get anxious. Like, What's going on here? This never happens. What's up? You know, call IT, whatever it is. I don't know what to do. So I just, I'm just typing now, like typing as fast as I can to get a thought out. But I don't really have anything. Like, you know when you type something and you're not being able to see it? And then you're able to see it later how incoherent it totally looks? That, that's what was happening to me. That was like the last part of the sermon <laughs> under conclusion incoherent thoughts that I, I can't even read. So I figured, forget about it. There's not going to be a conclusion. Or maybe this was the conclusion. So if you've been impatiently waiting for the end of the sermon, it's over, okay? <laughs> We're done. We're done. Just remember, they said, what do you talk about this morning? Patience. <laughs> How, how'd you do? Not well. But we all need to improve on this thing. We all need improvement, and we're thankful that God helps us through our failures and through our pain, through our suffering, to get better because he's committed to reaping a harvest through us. Let's pray. Father, uh, we're so thankful. We see these children uh, up front here. And we see families uh, growing. We see single people in our midst. We see um, all kinds of people, Lord. We think about uh, the pain and trial that we go through grieving loss, whether it's through the death of loved ones, whether it's through divorce, uh, whether it's through job change, school change, 
uh, loss of income. There's so many things, Lord, that will uh, increase our anxiety. So many opportunities we have to be patient. We pray today, Lord, as we think of the suffering that your people were going through in the first century, how easy it was to lash out. We pray, Lord, in this century that we'll be able to exercise uh, this fruit in such a way that will bring honor to you. Help us, Lord, as you are so patient with us to be patient uh, with others. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.